Level twos are the best. All right. Um, welcome to week nine. Hopefully you had a chance to rest a little bit during your reading week. I took time off and played video games for four days. And watched a ton of anime and went fishing. That's the, That was my week off. All right. So we're going to be talking about backup and restore today. So for the next couple of weeks, we're, we're going to be focusing on server administration tasks. No more design concepts, no more physical type stuff. It's actually about as theory as this course gets. So we're going to talk about what definite, what backups, uh, what the types of backups, some strategies. Um, there's a fairly, a fair number of redundant slides in this. So. You'll see. And then I'll talk specifically about doing backups in MySQL. Uh, and then I'll talk about the restore. And I'll describe Lab 6, I think it is, for backups uh, really quickly because some people always panic about it and because they, they read it and they don't understand what they're asking and they don't realize how literal the lab is. So, okay. A backup. A backup is a procedure for making extra copies of your data in case the server shits the bed. That's the technical term for a restoration in case of loss or damage is the server shit the bit. Um, how many of you actually back up your files on your computer? How many of you actually trust your laptops? How many of you trust your dogs or your children? For those of us that have kids. Okay. At least use OneDrive. So there's a bunch of terminology when we talk about backups. We have hot backups, cold backups, full backups, and actually I'll be going through all this terminology in a minute. Uh, incremental and differentials, uh, backup windows and a backup job. Uh, there's also online, offline, offsite. And um, there's compression, deduplication, and encryption. Um, I'm gonna go through these in a moment. So first things first, we're gonna talk about the types of backups. So there's a full backup. That's known as a level zero backup. It's a complete copy of a partition. Now, you notice that's using the word partition here instead of a database, uh, because some database servers actually create partitions on your hard drive to store the data. So often when you talk about doing a level zero backup, we're talking about backing up a partition. Um, some systems, um, Sybase, for example, is a good example. Man, there's a name I haven't heard in years. Uh, Sybase. When you install the database server, you have to have an unpartitioned disk. And it will actually partition the disk for itself. And when you back up Sybase, it's actually backing up partitions of the disk. Other people, when they back up their database servers, what they do is they stop the server, the database server, and then they back up the file system. So they can just restore the entire server as it is. Sometimes it's easier to restore whatever. Um, you have an incremental backup, which is a backup from only, it backs up the files that have changed since the full backup. So say on Sunday, on Sunday night, you do a full backup. The full backup is chunky, two terabytes. On Monday, you are going to want to do an incremental backup or differential, depending. An incremental says, oh, let's look at what's different from Sunday to today, and we're just going to back up those files. And then the differential is essentially the same idea, but it only backs up the changes since the last backup. So it doesn't make a difference if the last backup was a full or an incremental or a partial, whichever word you want to use. The differential basically does the difference from that. So um, if we look at that little chart they got at the bottom, if we have a system that says we are going to do full backups every day, which if you're on, for example, we were having a discussion about cloud computing earlier, and you're on Amazon and you're set up to do nightly backups, it will do full backups every night because they have the capacity to do full backups every night. So let's say you have a full backup, it's two terabytes. So every single day, your backups will occupy two terabytes of space. At the end of the week, it's eating up 14 terabytes. You need to rotate your backups more often because they take up a lot of room. And whether you're doing backups in building, like you're running your servers in-house and you back up to a server that's local, 
eventually you're going to run out of space, so you have to rotate the backups. And if you're doing full backups, you have to rotate your backups more often. That means you get you get to keep less history. Space costs money. If you're doing an incremental backup, what it'll do is on the first day, it'll do a full backup, two terabytes. On the Monday, the next backup might be one gigabyte. On Tuesday, 1.2 gigabytes, 1.6. What's happening is the incremental keeps the difference from the first full backup. So on Monday, there was one gig that changed. On Tuesday, potentially only 200 megs changed, so it's 1.2 gigs. On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you'll see that the number keeps getting bigger because that's just how much data is slowly changing. And if you do a differential backup, what's cool is on day one, two terabytes, day two might be a gigabyte because, you know, that's what we said was a gig on the first day. Enough that you'll notice that it'll be 0.2 gigs, 0.4 gigs, 0.3 gigs, 0.4. So the differential only backs up what's different. They're much smaller. Now, these all have certain advantages and disadvantages. The full backup has the advantage that it's really fast to bring your system back online because you've got the entire thing. So you just go, oh, 6 a.m., somebody went and typed in uh, delete from customers and they forgot their where clause and they hit run. You're like, shit. I've never done that. Yes, I have. Not that exact command, but it was very close to that. I had a backup from 2 a.m. And if you have a full backup, it's easy. You just take the server offline, drop the database, recreate the database, restore the backup. Poof, you're back to exactly where you were at 2 a.m. in minutes, depending on how big your database is. The other issue with the incremental, incremental is the next best choice for speed. It's a compromise between speed and space. So each backup will take up a little bit less room, but the issue you have is you'd have to back up the full, the Sunday backup, you'd restore the Sunday backup, and then you restore the difference. So let's say it's Wednesday. You'd have to grab the backup file for Wednesday and restore that on top of the two, to get two terabyte. So that means you have to do two restore operations. It takes longer. There's a risk of data corruption because, you know, it might have some conflicts. Um, then you have the differential, which it's the I need to save space approach, which at that point is, yeah, yeah. Let's say it is now Friday. Somebody during the night, overnight Thursday to Friday went and, you know, decided to not pay attention to what they were typing and they delete from customers. To be able to bring it back, what you have to do is you have to restore the Sunday backup, then the Monday backup, the Tuesday backup, the Wednesday backup to get yourself to that same point you were at 2 a.m. So you have to do multiple restores one after another. It has the same issue with the incremental backups where there's always a little risk that there's going to be or the, the restore doesn't work quite right because you're trying to fix things uh, as you go, uh, but it saves on a lot of room. Uh, the differential backup requires significantly more maintenance in the sense that at least once a month, you have to actually do a restore exercise. Then hey, we got to make sure that our backups are still going to work. So we're going to do a restore from, we're going to launch temporarily, do the full restore process from Monday to Friday just to be safe that it works. That's called disaster recovery planning and testing. Um, with the full backups, you don't need to do that. You just have to make sure you've got the full file. So this is where you start balancing, you know, how much disk space are we willing to sacrifice or how much, you know, how long, because the backups will take longer to run because they're big. They'll take longer to restore initially because they're big. But then once they're up, they're up. Um, so ideally, we'd like to back up everything all the time and keep it around forever. Um, that's also known as data hoarders. Um, at work, we just recently had a house cleaning process where we discovered that we had backups from our mail server from 14 years ago. What use is that? But we literally had backups occupying 500 gigs each from 14 years ago, just sitting there on hard drives in the server room. 
just on a box. And we plugged in one of those hard drives. They just went tonk because the drive has been sitting for so long, it died anyways. So we don't want to keep things forever. So in, what you need to do is you want to have a combination of short-term and long-term plans. So normally you have three copies of the data. And you'll notice that nowhere in any of this, I'm talking about cloud computing. The, these slides create cloud computing because these concepts still apply depending on what your situation is. For example, they have a local cache copy of their databases that applies to their customers. They will back that up locally. It'll be backed up off site. Then they probably have another backup somewhere else just to make sure that the data doesn't go anywhere. So you have three copies of the data, one off site. You will have a hot backup for convenience. A hot backup is a, um, basically another server running all the time, ready to go. A cold backup is a file that you restore into a server that you're going to turn on. Um, the cold backup is literally for disaster recovery uh, or if you're too cheap to have a second server running all the time. Small companies may not want to spend 20000 bucks to have a redundant database server just sit in there not actually doing anything. Um, one of the perks of cloud computing, you don't have to think about that stuff. Um, you have to test your restore procedures at multiple levels, as in, hey, it's Monday, let's test the restore from the full backup. Hey, it's Wednesday, let's test our restore. Whatever it happens to be, if it's an incremental or a differential or full backup, we need to test the steps multiple times. And sometimes you need to test regularly. And that means if you need to test this once a month, you're actually gonna be paying for someone to sit there and do that for two or three hours every month. The once you get out into the wild, you'll discover the most expensive resource of any IT company is the people, not the hardware. Hardware is cheap. Even when I say twenty thousand bucks for a server or five thousand bucks for a laptop, that is cheap compared to the person sitting at the keyboard. Where it could go anywhere from sixty grand for a fresh graduate to you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a COBOL developer. There's a range in there of cost, and you have to balance the cost of how you maintain it as well as you know the hardware to do it. Um, so when we do backups, we have offline and cold backups and online and hot backups. Now, an offline cold backup is literally you take the database, you dump it to a file, you take that file and you put it somewhere else. Um, we had our backups in three locations. One on a server. We actually had them in four locations, technically. On the, the database server itself, on a different disk. On a backup server in the same data center, in the same server rack. One off-site. And then one at a separate, in a data center, swear, like in a totally different geographic area. So that tornado comes through and it wipes out the office building and... Just what happens that the guys where the backup, the offsite backups are actually in somebody's basement. Sounds stupid now that I say it, but you know, it was literally in somebody's basement. And he lived really close to the office. So in theory, it's possible that it would take out his house and the office at the same time. Thus, we offloaded to a data center elsewhere. Uh, if I remember right, we were backing up to somewhere in California. Um, it was costing us a minor fortune, actually, but it was better than the risk of building getting flattened, right? Um, and then when you do a restore, you need to make sure you can restore the entire thing, the entire table space, in other words, the entire database structure. Um, you should try to build, you can also do a dev environment from a restore. Like I'll do that regularly where I'll back up our primary databases to my local machine. So then I'm fresh when I'm writing new features so that I write new features for our applications. They use a database that way we know for a fact that whatever I'm writing is going to work with what's there. What I have on my machine might be six, four months out of date. Therefore, maybe some new data has been inserted because we suddenly have some new customers in, I don't know, Bulgaria. And now they're slapping it in with, uh, you know, whatever the Bulgarian alphabet's called. And suddenly we have some weird UTF-8 characters in the database that we never planned for. If my database I'm working with is not up to date, that means I won't have this data in there. Therefore, it's 
convenient to have up-to-date data. Um, sometimes you'll use it for to recover uh, missing data in tables. Uh, that's one I've had to do because of something stupid I did. I ran a truncate table command and I truncated the wrong table. For my defense, it was 3 a.m. It's important to say truncate activation underscore GUIDs, not truncate activations. Um, I nuked like a million rows. And I was going, man, that's taking a long time. Because the other table only ever has 100,000 rows in it at most. I'm going, wait. Oh, that's not good. I had a backup from 45 minutes earlier. Oof. So I restored the backup, exported the data, imported the data into the other table database. So that's the partial recovery. Trust me, backup and restore, I've, if there's a way to screw up a database, I've done it during my career. I've also learned how to fix it, uh, which is why I can say this stuff with a smile and a chuckle, because if there's a way to screw it up, I've done it. Um, nobody's perfect. So so when you do a restore, re recovery, there's three purposes. One is to restore the live service. One is to have your dev environment or test environment. Another one is you something got damaged somewhere along the way, and you need to restore part of the data. So that's why you want to do the restores. So a cold backup is to perform. Um, it's satisfactory for databases where the content does not change very often. Or the users can tolerate downtime. So if it's not a 24 by 7 by 365, 99.99% available system, a cold backup, what happens is when you're doing a cold backup, the database server severs all the connections to the clients locks the database, backs it up to a file. Once it's done, it unlocks everything and lets people connect again. Um, we've all experienced this in one way or another. How many of you have gone to do a banking thing at like 1 a.m. on Saturday night and your bank says, no? I do now. Used to be, you're too young. There once was a time, I remember, where you couldn't deposit checks on the weekend. You're, you're, if you needed to deposit your paycheck and you didn't make it to the bank on Friday, it wasn't happening until Monday. And that's even with ATMs. Like you could not deposit a check on the weekends. It wouldn't let you. Because they were doing backups and weekend processing. Even now you'll notice. Uh, how many of you are with BMO? Okay, me. Not a lot. Okay, great. You may have noticed that there'll be your account balance will not match the transactions on the weekend. And then magically on Monday, especially when you debit debit card all weekend, and you'll see, oh, there's like 20 bucks left in my account. Why? And you look at it and there's like nothing to happen all weekend. And Monday, there's like a million transactions. It's because their systems are doing backups. So they lock out certain processes for the weekend. This is tolerating downtime. <laughs> so um, hot backups. They are much harder to do because it requires infrastructure. It requires servers. It requires... Uh, solid knowledge. However, it's really suited for mission critical systems. Banks are a good example. So hot backups, the way those work is you have a master database server and you have a bunch of I'm going to say slave. So there's a master slave. People don't like that phrase anymore, but it's a master slave because that's what it's called. What happens is every single time something gets written to the master, it gets copied to the slaves. So to the recipient databases, the child databases. And so these child databases will, if the master database server shits the bed, we can switch which one's the master by typing in a few commands or with like Microsoft SQL Server, you just promote one to be the master. And suddenly, all the read-write commands will now go to that machine and it will copy its changes to all the other child. The one that died, you take it offline, you wipe it, reinstall it, add it back to the replication group and it'll get a fresh copy from the master server and then it'll be synchronized and then you can just switch them back. Much more complex. But what's cool about it is it's entirely possible to never be down. Because if one server stops responding 
a lot of the load balancing tools will automatically switch you to another master automatically. So a lot of the a lot of these clusters will do, will take care of itself just fine. Uh, again, another nice perk of cloud computing type setups where they just do it for you if you just you're willing to double or triple your costs every month. Uh, you say I want this database, it's multi-zone, so it'll make copies of it in all the zones at all times. It just takes care of it for you. It's like magic. Um, the other perk is with if you're in a hot backup type setup in a cluster environment, you can do cold backups whenever you want because you can just do a cold backup off of one of the slaves. So you've got the master who's constantly writing stuff. The slave is doing its thing. It can be taken offline temporarily to do the cold backup. And then when it comes back online, everything it missed, it just gets told what everything it missed, which is cool. Uh, so where do you store the backups? Normally, at least one copy on the database server itself on a separate hard disk or partition, uh, ideally a separate hard disk, so that if you lose one drive, you're not going to lose your backup too. Um, you're going to copy one to another server, usually another one on-site, one off-site, or one into cloud storage. Um, for a while, we were throwing our backups into uh, Amazon S3 buckets, because uh, buckets are stupid cheap. It's something like a dollar terabytes for storage space. It costs nothing. They're just slow. But it's a backup. It doesn't need to be fast. You just got to make sure it doesn't go away. Um, and then back up the tape. And I didn't realize this. I thought nobody used tape anymore. Until I was listening to my daughter in one of her meetings with her IT, her new IT, her new IT manager, and she goes, "He goes, so do you know who's been tasked in swapping the tapes in the server room?" She goes, "No." The old manager left. They put in a new manager, and nobody was tasked with actually rotating the tapes on the backups. Good job, CRA. Um, it's a really small division, so it's not your tax information, but you know. Whoa, cool. uh, tape backups are still there. Tape backups are around because they're cheap. Like you can get a tape, uh, they're called DATS, digital analog tape. And they're about uh, that big, right? And each tape will hold like 10 terabytes. They cost like five bucks. Wow, well, 20 bucks. Dollar to terabyte is the cheapest thing you can get after cloud computing with the tapes. They're slow, they can be stolen. Which is a danger. Uh, they need to be rotated regularly. They do die after a while. You can only do so many backups on them until they become unreliable, and then they're just e-waste. But you know, tapes are a thing, um, and you should try to have your backup in multiple locations. So, you know, just don't have one backup. Have multiple backups. Which leads me back to the whole: at least use one drive on your laptops, because Microsoft's. Your files, when they go up to Microsoft, they're on a cluster environment where they're on multiple servers at any point in time. So the odds are your files are never going to be completely erased unless Microsoft just disappears tomorrow, which is not likely. Okay, so back up MySQL. MySQL is an absolute pain in the butt to back up. Um, as you may have experienced so far working with MySQL and MariaDB, it's not always a good time. So. What needs to be backed up with MySQL? The database content, obviously. So those are full backup. They're usually physical backups. So you take the whole database, you dump it to a file, take the file and you copy it. Um, there's log files. You can do incremental backups and point in time recovery uh, with MySQL. It's really painful to do it. Uh, almost nobody does it because it's so unpleasant to do, but it can be done. Um, you want to save your configuration information. Uh, usually it's a my.cnf file, um, any cron jobs that you have running. Uh, the config files you probably want to put into some sort of source control management so that, you know, if you need to make changes to your config file and you discover something's wrong, you just, you know, go to a previous revision and just restore. Um, MySQL has something called the binary log, and it contains every SQL command that changes the data. So it's statement-based. In other words, you have insert into table example. These values, that actually gets written into the binary log. 
saying, Dan just ran that command. And it stores some statistics. Oh, this query took five seconds to run, 10 seconds, or, you know, 500 milliseconds, that kind of thing. Um, the binary log is literally a binary format. You cannot read it as a human. There's no way to read it. It's You try to look at it, and it's just trash. Because it's literally binary, a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, you have to manually turn it on. Uh, you can use a command called MySQL log, uh, bin log to decipher the log contents. So they have a command that allows you to take the log file and extract the commands that were run, which has some dangers. Because if you have cases where people are setting passwords or changing passwords, you can actually get them out of the bin log. So that's why a lot of people don't turn on the bin log because you're storing potentially storing sensitive information in that file, and you you know. Uh, and they get created, you know, dot zero zero one zero zero two onwards and onwards. Binary logs are transaction compatible. When we talk about transactions later, uh, that'll make sense. But essentially, it survives transactions. Uh, MySQL D, which is the service for for MySQL, uh, will create a log index file, which tells it where all the binary log files are stored. Um, so the bin log is used. So you have a full backup. So day one, you do a full MySQL backup to a file. Great. You decide you want to do incrementals every day. So what you can do is every day you just back up the bin log files, and then you can extract all the commands out of them and run them, like replay the changes since the full first, the full backup. You can imagine how much work that would be. Like it's not just, oh, I want you to restore at this point in time. I want you to, you have to take the commands, extract, figure out when they were run, run them back in the order they were run in. Yes, you can do it. It's not easy. Uh, when you go to back files up, um, when you go to back up the database, the command is called MySQL dump. Because you're taking the contents of the database and you're dumping it into a file. So it's MySQL dump. Um, and MySQL dump is really special. Um, because if you type in MySQL dump and you just dump everything as is, you will notice that there's a little redirect right at the end here. Notice the redirect output. If you don't do that, it actually dumps the database contents to the screen. Just, I'm hacking now. Pretend you're typing. In actual fact, I've seen several shows and movies where they're, you know, the hackers are accessing files and they're literally just running a, a database backup across the screen. Because it's, stuff going by fast. Um, the, the file itself, you can choose to dump individual tables in the entire database. Um, essentially, MySQL dump creates a bunch of SQL commands. It'll have the create tables, the insert statements. Uh, it'll do all, create the referential integrity, set the indexes and all that fun stuff, it'll, the views, everything you have in there. It'll all be contained in there. It'll actually create them in the order they need to be created happened in the order it needs to be restored. Um, and you can also take the MySQL dump and feed it from one server to another server. So you want to clone the database from one to the other. That's that example at the bottom. Uh, so you're dumping the, the database called world. You're piping it back into the MySQL command where you are connecting to another host and feeding into another database. So in a single command, you can actually back up one database server into another database server. It's going to be slow, but it can be done. Um, I had to do that, something very simple, about a year and a half ago, when we decided to move one of our database servers from being on an in, like a, on a VM image into an actual managed database service, Amazon. I copied the data directly from the instance into the managed service by a command very similar to that. Um, it took about four hours for six gigabytes of data. It was slow. I regretted, I had regrets that day because I couldn't go home because it was running on my laptop and I wasn't allowed to leave my laptop in the office. And if I control C, did it control C to cancel? Guess what happened? It wouldn't finish. So I got to sit there for three and a half hours doing nothing. Regrets. Um, 
so there's a few extra hints um, that you can use. Um, there's a double dash single transaction. So if you're backing up InnoDB tables, uh, MariaDB doesn't have InnoDB, it just it has something else. Uh, it's basically if you are dumping a database table that supports transactions, you want to do the whole backup as a single transaction so that you don't miss anything. Uh, lock all tables is useful if you want to lock the database completely so they can't be changed while you're doing your backup. Uh, flush logs flushes the binary log. So at you are so when you do the full backup, say on Sunday night, you would include the flush logs. It, at that point, since you have a full backup that's working, when the backup completes, it clears the binary log files so that fresh incremental starting all over again. Okay, now for the restore. Uh, the definition of restore, it's using a backup to restore the database to a previous, previous state, also known as you need to recover from the server that shit the bed. Server is brought back up. You need to get the data on there. Away you go. Um, reason to restore. Uh, you're recovering from failure. You are creating another copy. In other words, a dev copy, a QA copy, whatever. Or need to uh, restore to a previous state. In other words, you realize that uh, the intern you recently hired started deleting records out of the database with the application and they weren't supposed to be able to do that. And you're like, oh, oh, we need to go back and fix that. That's a, a reason for a restore. Um, I've never witnessed that either. Okay, so how do you do a restore in MySQL? You go MySQL at the command line. You'll notice the reverse pipe, the reverse feed backup.sql. Now, this is where I'm going to warn you guys about lab six. Don't use PowerShell. For those of you on Windows, do not use PowerShell. Use the old style CMD prompt. PowerShell will hate you if you try to do this, but it works fine in the old DOS prompt. Mac users, congratulations, you're good. It's the only time you'll ever hear me say that about Macs. You'll have no problems. The only thing is the paths to your executables are different than the Windows ones. You just got to figure out where your executables are. That's the biggest problem you guys have. But input, output, redirect, no problem. Um, and then if you need to do a incremental backup, as you can see, you can do MySQL bin log. Um, you feed it, you know, the bin file name. I just don't know why that's wrapping. That should be all one line. And then you feed it into uh, the MySQL command. Um, and then you feed it one file at a time. So depending on how busy your server is, you might be doing a lot of these files, one after another. Okay. Um, in MySQL, there's a few utilities that are handy to have. Um, MySQL, you guys, your last term were using data grip. Uh, I don't know if you actually opened up a DOS prompt version of MySQL or not. Um, or a command prompt version of MySQL. If you have not, you are about to. Um, actually, it's a command line based tool for MySQL. Actually, I'll show you guys that in a minute. Uh, if I think I've got that installed on my laptop. Uh, MySQL admin allows you to create and drop databases from the command line. So you don't need to actually connect to the database. You can actually just run it quickly. And then uh, MySQL dump is used to actually do the backups. All right, let me go see if I can find um, the stuff that I need. So yes, like I said, guys, use CMD under Windows. Don't use PowerShell. Uh, in case you're curious, PowerShell will come up and look, it'll say PowerShell. Don't use PowerShell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in theory, you could do like 90% of the lab without PowerShell, and then you're going to get to the end and you're going to go, Dan said there's something wrong with this, and I don't remember what it was. Just start with CMD. Life will be better. Uh, now, in my case, my SQL is installed in a different spot than you guys. Here. No. I'm so used to working on Linux. Uh, bin. 
uh, MySQL, DIR. Oh, yeah, I'm running a really old version of MySQL on here too, as you can tell. Um, specifically because one of our servers runs 5.7, so I have to stay on that version. Um, that was stupid of me. Backslash MySQL, MySQL. And it's probably going to give me an error. Oh, am I running? Hang on. One. Okay, so that's why. Uh, actually, I do have my skill installed the same way you guys do. Program files, MySQL, eight bin. Access denied, of course. Oh, by the way, you're going to actually get some questions that are going to, that are going to say, hey, you got an error. What does the error say? Um, that's how you're kind of getting a preview of what the lab's going to put you through. Using password. No, oh, I, you know what's stupid? I can't remember my password. No, it's not that, as I don't remember my SQL password. Um. For me, I'd rather just uninstall and reinstall. There, I remembered my password. No, it's one, two, three, four. Because um, if I get a physical access to your machine, like if I can actually open a command prompt on your machine, I get a USB drive plugged in. It's a, it'll take me about 15 seconds to get your MySQL database off this machine. So I secure password on your MySQL. Physical security will defeat that. Yes, there is a way. It's a pain in the ass. You got to drop a file in a specific place, and then you got to pass parameters to the to the to the daemon that starts. It's not two seconds. So this is literally this is old school typing in commands. You know, All right, so this is your command line MySQL. It'll look exactly the same on Mac as on Windows for this. You guys won't need to do this. You're going to be using the MySQL dump tool and the MySQL restore. But you know, this is what you're this is what you're going to be looking at is the kind this kind of stuff. Um, so. Enough of that. But yeah, that's essentially it. So in Windows, you, you can have a path. It's somewhere under your program files. You notice I had to go to the whole path. In Mac, I have no idea where MySQL installs. If you're really lucky, it's going to be part of your path. You can just type in the MySQL command and not worry about everything else. In Windows, it's not part of the path. So just saying. Windows guys actually got this one a little harder than the Mac users. Uh, the only time you're going to have a problem on Mac is if you're running MariaDB and MySQL at the same time. 50-50 chance things are going to work. And I don't know how to fix you. Just saying. Okay, so uh, that, that is it. Like literally 45-minute lecture and we all get to, be, to bail. Um, does anybody have any questions about backups and whatnot before I let everybody run? It's actually a pretty straightforward concept. Like, Make copies of your stuff so you don't lose your stuff. Make sure you can actually restore your stuff. That's that's backup and restore or simplified. Sideways? Missing? Yeah, no, the, the thing is, is that it depends. So if you're in a high security environment where 
even the database administrators can access the database directly. The, it's rare. Um, those kinds of environment, the servers will have RAID arrays, so they have redundant disks. They'll often be in a cluster environment, so there's multiple copies of the database running at the same time. It's rare. Um, data caused by human error is much more common. Where, you know, oh, Dan needs to clear this out so he can do some upgrades, and Dan types in the wrong command. That happens. You want to have backups for that kind of situation. Um, another one where somebody was hired and they weren't paying attention to their instructions and someone and they were literally hired to clean up the data and they, they didn't understand what was asked. That happens a lot more than you'd think. Um, but how often does it happen that a piece of hardware just dies? It's not that common. Um, a lot of people trust SSDs like they're the, you know, God's gift to hard drives because there's no moving parts. Things about SSDs is they start to die and you don't know they're dying. They die quietly. No, but the people are laughing when I said that. So most of you, and I'll teach you a little bit about hardware right now. So when you have a uh, an SSD, basically solid state drive, and you buy a one terabyte drive, that drive is actually 1.2 terabytes. Not talking about the formatted space, it actually has 1.2 terabytes of, mem of memory on it. And whether the software, the firmware, what it does is as it detects, so you read and write, read and write, read and write all over the disk, right? Eventually the memory cells start to wear out, right? What it does is as it detects the memory cells dying is it'll say, oh, that area is now dead. We're going to grab a bit of space out of this extra 200 megabytes we have. Oh, we lost a little more, grabs a little bit more from the 200 megabytes again. There was a case at work, at least it wasn't a server, but it was somebody's top where he goes, hey, Dan, my hard drive's shrinking. I go, what do you mean? I go, watch this. He goes, okay, look, see my C drive? It's showing 950 megabytes. I'm like, that's, a, that's like a 1.2 terabyte drive. Why is it 950? He goes, wait. He reboots his laptop, 925 megabytes. And during the reboot, the trim process is detecting that the memory chips were dying. And every time the drive reset itself, it was actually trimming space because it ran out of spare. So with solid state drives, one of the maintenance tasks of, even if it's solid state drives in a RAID array, the RAID array has to be a RAID array that understands solid state, not spin disks. And it actually monitors the amount of reserve space it has. There's ways for it to know how much reserve space it has. And once it runs out of reserve space, it marks the drive as dead. It needs to be replaced. No, it's fully dead, but it's compromised. And then it needs to be replaced. So does it happen very often? In the last six years, I've had a hard drive die on me twice. Only once was it important. We don't even use, but now everything we have is all sitting on cloud computing because we don't want to deal with the hardware anymore. Let Amazon be liable for our data. Let, let, let it be somebody else's problem whenever you can. That's a, that's a very important philosophy. Let it be somebody else's problem whenever you can. Um, unless that's the job you want. And then it's going to be your problem. I don't want that job. <laughs> it used to be my job. I don't want it anymore. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. Yo, out the door. I thought you were raising your hand. Uh, you're out the done, out the door. I'll see you guys in lab.